Hello again. This is our fifth lesson next to the last one. Today what I want to tell you is put a fire for the lost to evangelize those that are perishing without Christ. I recently conducted a funeral at a cemetery and saw hundreds of dead corpses but today I think there are millions of dead corpses walking today because they don't know Christ. Many churches actually have spiritually dead corpses that only the Word of God can bring to life. This is what Jesus was recoiling from in the Garden of Gethsemane because all of God's holy wrath and his hatred towards sin was stored up from the beginning of time and is about to be poured out upon him and for all future sin too. He is sweating great drops of blood at the thought of it. This is why God forsook Jesus at Calvary and Jesus said, my, my God, why have you forsaken me? Today we say, let Jesus come into my heart, blunder your heart, read this sinner's prayer, sign this card, come forward and accept Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach this. We ask, just accept Jesus. You really think Jesus needs our acceptance? A serious warning is given by Jesus where he says, in the Sermon of the Mount, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, get that, many will say to me on that day, tragically, that day will be too late. They'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons, perform many miracles? In Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, how shocking that is. Many will find themselves outside of the kingdom. Being a pastor, this makes me want to run down the aisle of my own church that I under shepherd and tell them to wake up because how many people are there sitting in the church that are not truly converted and sold out for Christ enough to die for him? Think about that. Many might be think they're saved, but they're not. Just like those in the world that you'll witness to think they're going to heaven, but they're not. You want to just grab them by the collar and tell them to wake up. But that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Unless we're willing to turn away from our own comfort zone and take up the cross of Christ and carry it with us, we're not totally surrendered to Christ. We're ignoring the Great Commission and living the Great Omission like I was for many years. The question is, are we going to trust in His power? Or are we going to trust in our power instead? The challenge is to live in such a way that we're radically, that we're radically dependent on and desperate for the power of God. We're not the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit do its work. But we put feet to the Gospel. The gospel beckons us to die to ourselves and to believe in God and trust in His power. In Romans 1.16, it is the power of God. The gospel is the very power of God. The Greek word for that power is dynamo. It's like dynamite. He has the power, but we have to bring the message. Jesus said in John 15.5, when we go out and share the gospel, we can't do anything in our own power. Nothing. There is, God delights actually in a place where we absolutely realize our total helplessness without Him and the Holy Spirit. Gideon is a supreme example of God's power being displayed in minuscule human numbers and strength. But what was happening is God is orchestrating the events of His people so that in the end only He could get the glory. God frequently puts his people in positions where they're desperate for his power and then he shows his provision in ways that display his greatness. God is no respecter of persons or numbers. Huge churches do not make huge impacts all the time. We have the false idea that a church that is has a full parking lot and has huge mega complexes have charismatic preachers and an awesome church band and sound system. But what is what are they glorying in? In their own facilities? 
Instead, we need to have an utter and complete desperate need for God's power. The key point is that the disciples, nor do you or I, add numbers to the church when we share the gospel. Now they did go to all ends of the world. They left their own communities and their own towns. In Acts 2, verse 41, 3,000 were added to the number that day. In verse 47, and the Lord added to the number daily as those were being saved. Acts 11:24, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And a host of Gentiles were appointed for eternal life in Acts 13:48. The point is that God draws people to Christ, but we have to bring the message to them. A scene where the church radically trusts in God's great power to provide unlikely people with limited, unforeseen, uninhibited resources to make his name known as great. It's not of our doing, but of God's. God delights in that when we utterly, desperately depend upon him. That's what glorifies God. From Genesis to Revelation, it's always about God's glory being displayed. He is most glorified, actually, when we are weak, insignificant, frail, feeble, and bring nothing to the table. We must be in a position of weakness before God, before he shows himself strong. That's how he's glorified. Any church, even a small one that I under-shepherd, and one that has definitely little money, I don't even draw a salary because I don't want to stress the church. Even small churches can shake mighty nations for his glory. The Great Awakening was started by one man and prayer. One tiny little church in one month of God's power can do more than a 50,000 member church can do in a year apart from God's provision. His power is infinite. Ours is finite. Why don't we desperately seek Him? Good question. God loves to display His great power in a few insignificant believers and sometimes turns His back on the mighty mega churches that are supposedly not dependent upon anything or anyone. They depend upon their own strength and their numbers and their finances and their budget instead of relying on Him. In the history of the Bible and the church, there are hundreds of examples where ordinary people that are often the least regarded choose to trust in God and He provided extraordinary things. God holds all the resources in the universe in the palm of His hand. And he's ready and waiting for the people of God who desperately desire to reveal and display his glory to people to come to him. Why don't we ask God to accomplish only what he can accomplish? I think the greatest need we have right now is to fall on our face, hands and knees and lay prostrate before a mighty God and plead with him to reveal himself in a mighty way, to display his radical power in and through us, weak vessels, which enables us to accomplish things for his glory, what we could never ever dream of doing in our own strength. You know, God created us to glorify him, to go to the ends of the earth. Instead, we settle for sitting in the pews staying at home, or being a homebound Lone Ranger Christian for many. You know, God wants to extend His glory to all ends of the earth. In Revelation, it talks about all people from all nations will worship Him. Many want to know what God's will is. People ask me, I want to know the will of God. Let me tell you, here it is. Clearly, God's will is to spread his glory to all ends of the earth, to lift up and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. That is God's will. 
You don't have to fast for it, pray for it, seek it. We can read it in the Bible. Sad thing is the gospel has become me-centered. He sought me. He caught me. He bought me. He taught me what I ought be. He chose me. He saved me. He forgave me. It's almost like we are the objects of his faith instead of him being the object of our faith. We're not the end of the gospel, but he is the end of the gospel. He is the center of the universe. I am not. That's why we first must be concerned about God's glory when we share the gospel. That is why we go. If we try to do it any other way, to simply fill the pews, build membership, increase our roles, we will fail. Glorify God. That is what it's all about. Jesus did not save us just to have us sit in the pew. He did not create us to just be set there and fed. We like the benefits, but we don't like to be ambassadors. We like to sit back and enjoy salvation, but we don't like to share salvation. He commanded us to make disciples of all nations. You know, we like to donate money for missionaries, fund overseas missions, give to the poor, pray for nations to know Christ, while we sit in our comfortable cushioned pews in church. The Great Commission is the great omission for 95% of churches today. Many times I go by myself and it hurts because I'd rather have others go with me. I have a retired pastor friend that I met visiting and now he's going with me. I didn't ask him to attend church. He already attends another church. But he has bought into the passion for the lost. Many say that they're not comfortable talking to strangers. They don't have the gift of evangelism. That is not one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is evangelizing or going door to door. I'm not called to do that, some people say. In my seminary work, there's a Greek word for that. I believe it's called baloney. I don't have the gift of evangelism. It's not a gift to have or not. The Great Commission is a command. Most are happy to sit back and let others do the evangelizing, like the pastor or the church leadership. But a person sees someone going to hell in their mind and thinking about where they'll spend eternity at, it should compel us to go. If you had a cure for cancer, would you just swallow the cure while others in the hospital are dying? Of course not. You would share that with others. But that's what most Christians are doing. They're not sharing the credible cure of Jesus Christ from the blood of the Lamb of God. Being disobedient to the Great Commission is like picking and choosing what we want to obey. We like these promises. We like that promise. We like it when we're blessed. We like it when we're forgiven. But we don't like it when he tells us to go. So since only 5% of Christians actually go out and proclaim the gospel and lead others to Christ. What if God only gave us 5% of his promises? 5% of our sins are forgiven. He only blesses us 5%. Think about this. When someone reaches eternity without Christ, do we not understand that the unsaved person will spend torment day and night forever and ever without end every single born again Christian is ordered to do this there is no plan B we are his one and only plan my friends 
You know, churches strategize on new seating, sound systems, church bands, activities, youth nights. Those are all fine. But the consequences of activities in the church ignore the consequences of the church people outside of the church. People go to hell without Christ. The last thing people say is usually the most meaningful and impactful. Christ's last two things given to us were to go and make disciples of all nations. Must have been important to him. He wants to bring glory to himself. And why shouldn't he? He is God. And he is worthy of all honor, praise, and glory. Our awesome, mighty God. He told us others to tell, told us to tell others about Christ, and then they would make other disciples to tell others about Christ, and those others would tell others yet to tell others about Christ. It's self-replicating. It's like a single cell organism that duplicates and then squares and then continues to grow. It's like the mustard seed. One of the smallest seeds Yet, it has to grow. Let me say this too, that we can sit back in church and we can sit there and sitting in the church pew for one hour sermon, maybe an hour in Sunday school, being taught by two leaders or a pastor and two, you know, Sunday school teacher, music minister, and then go home that is not what Christianity is all about. Enoch supposed to walk with God. That meant walking is day and night, seven days a week. Many who sit in churches today, I fear, are playing churchianity. We falsely judge churches by the size of their parking lot, their sanctuary, their list of activities, the number of Sunday school attendants. Yet the fact is only Christian believers, evangelical Christians, only give 2.5% of their income while spending the bulk of their money on facilities or their own activities. You know, every single year, churches spend $10 billion in church buildings. They own $230 billion in church property. But they won't, they leave a fraction for evangelism. I spend my own money for Bible tracts. I buy my own webcams. I travel to churches my own expense. Because I see the internal importance is our treasure is where our heart is at. If you look at someone's checkbook ledger, for example, you can tell where their treasure is at. It is in the things of the kingdom or things of the world. John Calvin once said that half of the church's funds should be allotted specifically to the poor and to missionary work. Today, it's less than one half percent of church budgets. That's less than half of a percent go to missionary work or evangelism. This is while millions and millions still cannot call on the name of the Lord because they've never heard Jesus' name. It's like we give them spare change, like those cans you'll find in convenience stores and helping so-and-so that needs a heart, you know, or a kidney transplant or They'll put coins in there. We'll put our change in there. Our treasure apparently is not there. In God's plan to spread the gospel, no plan B, we are as plan A and as only plan. Try to find any place in the New Testament where a person comes to faith without the aid of someone going, like Paul is a supreme example, imperiling his life his reputation, and all. He forsake his own life, living a lucrative lifestyle, that he was one of the Pharisees of the Pharisees. He was one that was set for life. 
Moses could have been heir to the throne in Egypt, but he forsook it all. Today there's 1.5 billion people that have not yet heard Jesus' name. There's 5,000 people groups. Sometimes there's more than one people group in one nation. In one remote village where one missionary went, they've never even heard about Jesus Christ. The tribal leader brought back the missionary a Coke. The missionary thought, wow, Coca-Cola has done a better job of reaching the tribes than a God-commanded church. Jesus promised that this gospel would be taken to the whole populated world, to the ends of the earth. If you want to know what God's will is, this is it. To save those who are lost. We know that God does not take pleasure in the eternal death of the wicked. If you're seeking to know God's will and have it revealed, this is it. To save those who are perishing without Christ. No one said it would be easy. In fact, let me, as I wrap this up, close out with Jesus said that it would be dangerous. But he said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who wants to lose his life will gain it eternally. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 through 31. Matthew 10, 16 through 31. I've had dogs chase me. I've had to put uh, these salvation plans, I've had to put them in a fence where there were pit bulls at. Uh, I didn't go inside the fence. I've had a cat chase me, actually. Uh, I've, I've actually had doors slammed in my face. I had a guy met me at the door with a shotgun once. I think he thought I was a Jehovah Witness and he was going to have an answer. But the guy realized that I was not. And he sat there and listened to me for 30 minutes share the gospel with him. Matthew 10, 16, 30. Matthew 10, 16 through 31. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard because you'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. That may not happen to you, but I've actually had the police wonder, am I canvassing? Am I trying to sell something? The police were suspicious of me because I was going door to door. But what I had, no one could afford. But I was giving it away free. Offering the message of the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Moving to verse 21 of Matthew 10. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. That may not happen, but maybe think about this verse 22. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, go to another. Surely I'm telling you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That is, we will be going into the Great Commission, into the harvest field, up to the time that Christ returns. The student is not above the teacher, nor is the servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. And as I finish here, verse 26 through 31 of Matthew 10. Do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I've told you in dark, speak in daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. 
rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. The will of God then is to take the gospel every place you go. There may be some dangerous places. It may be hot days. It may be cold days. It may be risky. It may be unsafe. But is it not worth risking all we have, our time, our talent, our treasure? Our treasure might be our time. Our money might be spent in supporting missionaries and evangelism. Author David Platt once said, The danger in our lives will always increase in proportion to the depth of our relationship with Christ. But don't we want to have a deep personal and meaningful relationship with Christ? Most believers do want a deep personal relationship with Christ. But they may not want to take the risk when they go out and evangelize. I traveled one time to a risky place and it was I was sharing the Hell's Best Kept Secret, the way of the Master, and using the law of God. And the pastor drove me around what he called the hoods. And it were kind of a dangerous areas and a very low income. The neighborhood was in pretty bad shape. Some former drug dealers and current drug dealers, former prisoners, many on parole. What I saw were hundreds and hundreds of doors that could be knocked on, that nobody ever went. When I knocked on doors, I found people that had said, it's been 20, 30, 35 or more years since anyone from an evangelical church ever came to share the gospel with them. That is a great omission. In fact, I think I've met a few people from other churches. We are the smallest church. We are the poorest church in our community. Yet we are the only ones that I believe are making a difference for the kingdom because we are going out into all our own area. This weekend, The retired pastor that I met, going door to door, we're going to go to the malls. We're going to go out and share the gospel with people in a bigger city, Wichita, Kansas, who have no chance to ever come to our church. Our church is in a small town south of there. We're going out to reach the lost. Who cares if we don't increase numbers in our church? We're trying to fulfill the Great Commission. And for what both of us used to be the great omission. Thank you very much. And the next time we're gonna I'm gonna talk about apologetics and I'm gonna go over some information about science, creation, Jesus Christ's historicity, evidence for the resurrection, the veracity of the Bible, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and archaeology, and show you some things that are facts that will show you well reasons, grounded reasons for the fact that the Bible is true and the history of the Bible is like the history of mankind. History is his story. I cannot wait to share this with you. It's so exciting to know that the things you read in the Bible are being proven by history, archaeology, and science all the time we see more and more evidence for that it's so exciting and that will be our conclusion next week to always be prepared to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you in kindness and gentleness with all meekness and to pray in jesus name we'll see you next time that we glorify god all ends of the earth thank you so much